Amen. You may be seated. We can turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 28. We'll go to the end of the book of Acts, chapter 28, verse 28. The last message in our series of Christ's Kingdom Commission is entitled, Of the Increase of His Government, There Will Be No End. Acts 28, starting in verse 28, hear now the word of the Lord. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He, Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is the word of the living and true God. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that through your word that it would be taught this morning uh, with all boldness and without hindrance and that as a result this salvation that you have sent to us, we will listen to it, we will heed it, and we will see it be proclaimed in our city, in our homes, uh, in our nation, and in the world. We ask it in the mighty and authoritative name of Jesus. Amen. So, Of the increase, there will be no end. We come today to the last message in this series on the book of Acts, chapter 1 through 12, uh, which this series I called Christ's Kingdom Commission. I was, in fact, I was just thinking this week, I got to go and change the sign for the first time in like months. So that's always a task, but it's kind of a good one because it means that we've been somewhere. It means that we've spent time, a uh, good time, good amount of time looking at God's word. And perhaps maybe you wonder um, why I chose a certain book of the Bible don't, don't look into it too much. My mind is a scary place. Uh, but if you, if you do wonder that, um, maybe you also wonder why it is that we're stopping at chapter 13 and not going on in the book of Acts. And there's several reasons for all of that, those decisions, whether they're good ones or not, I don't know. But um, they can be summed up, I think, my reason can be summed up from a verse from Proverbs 28:18. Proverbs 28, 18 says, Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, or the people are discouraged. But blessed is he who keeps the law. So that's Proverbs 28, 18. Now we have to be careful with this verse, uh, because it can be used in a lot of different ways. It can be used for, uh, for somebody to say, the people need a vision. So therefore, uh, here's the vision, people. Grab onto it, otherwise you'll be discouraged. Uh, The verse was used that way on February 6th, 1985, at least the first part of the verse, uh, when it was quoted in a State of the Union address in the King James Version uh, by Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan at the time, regarding the vision for uh, this country that was laid out by the framers of the Constitution, the fathers of the nation, who had a dream of freedom for the future. He said, where there is no vision, the people perish. And how grateful we are that we have a vision from our founders to pick up and follow. Well, with all due respect to to the president, that's that's not necessarily what that verse means, is talking about. So we have to be careful. In coming to the church here, um, I realized that one of the tasks that was in front of me, in front of us as a body, was going to be casting a vision for what the future looks like. Uh, putting, putting a picture out there of where we at Goshen First Brethren are going to be heading. But here's the thing about this verse. The verse isn't talking about a personal, um, a, a personable, personable communication that I receive from the Lord in my quiet time and then I bring out here and lay it in front of you all and say, here's what the Lord has given me, uh, so let's follow that. That's not what this verse says. 
Instead, the verse, when we read the whole thing like I did just a second ago, the whole thing pairs together the word vision with the words God's law. In other words, the Bible. So what Proverbs 28.18 says is where there is no prophetic vision, in other words, where there is no vision from the Lord, where there is no uh, uh, authoritative, scriptural, biblical mandate, vision cast from the, from the Lord, the people are discouraged. The people perish. But, he says, here's the flip side of it, blessed is he who keeps the law. So in other words, the, the, the antidote for discouragement when we have a lack of vision is to look to the Word, to look to the Bible, and to say, okay, Lord, what's, what's our pattern? What's our marching orders? What, what, what vision would you lay out for us as a church to follow and to go after? That's why I determined um, to open up the book of Acts where the church is found in its infancy. It is found in, um, in, in primal form, if you will. Now, some will say that means that the church as an infant, we shouldn't necessarily follow the early church because it was immature. I don't think so. I think instead we should look to that and see it in seed form. In, in all the elements are there, and then it comes to full bloom as the church develops and matures. So as we look to the book of Acts, what we were looking for was a biblical picture or a vision of what the church is, what Christ created the church to be, what he structured the church to be. And then, like, like James says, the hope for me was, the, my, my prayer was that we as a congregation, that we would look at God's word and we wouldn't be like the foolish man who goes and looks in a mirror and sees some, some you know, I'm, this is my commentary, sees some stray hairs flying away and sees a pimple on his face and, and then walks away without doing anything about it. Because that's the foolish man. Instead, the wise person goes to the mirror of God's word and says, okay, this fits, this doesn't, this looks good, this needs changed, and then does that changing. So that's, that, that's my hope. Uh, our vision must be directly from the word of the Lord. It doesn't matter what, what my vision is if it doesn't match what the scripture says. It doesn't matter what our vision is if it, doesn't ma- if it doesn't match what the Scripture says. We need God's Word to send us in the right direction. Now, I plan to preach on uh, Thanksgiving and thankfulness next week, because that seems fitting. Uh, and then we'll begin our Advent series in the Gospel of Luke, the first two chapters. But then in the new year, we're going to continue this vision uh, conversation uh, in uh, in the book of First Timothy, uh, where it's, it's just laid out verse by verse, plainly, here's what the church ought to be. And the hope, again, is that as we do that, we get a clear and clearer vision, a picture of what the Lord would like us to be here at Goshen First Brethren. So here, here's, here's some things that I learned. Um, I'm going to tell you those here in a minute. As, as I've studied through this book of Acts, uh, but I wonder this morning, what have we learned? I asked that question on Wednesday night. Uh, you know, what, what is it as we've gone through the book of Acts? What are those themes that have risen to the top again and again each week? What things have you heard repeated from the Word again and again in those first 12 chapters? Those are the things we should be looking for. And I encourage you uh, to, even as you're, you're hearing me speak this morning, write down some words or phrases or concepts or themes that you've heard from the word, because again, we want to be like the wise man who, has, who looks at the word and says, okay, here's what we need to be. We don't want to walk out of here saying, well, I'm not really sure what that book of Acts was all about. Uh, take some time to review yourself and reflect uh, on what the word has said and how we ought to follow it. But this morning, um, I'm going to give you, uh, lay out some, some of the main points uh, that were on my list, I think, as we've studied through this book. Um, and as we continue this, this task, uh, we need to do it together. So uh, you don't get any extra credit points if your points match mine. I mean, the Lord might give them to you. I don't know. But I, right, it, the, the, the goal is, is that we all arrive at one picture. So let's dive in. What, what, when it comes to the inner life of the church, when it comes to this body interacting with each other, 
structuring ourselves. The vision of the church, I think, is laid out plainly back in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I think you can't get any more simp- excuse me, simplistic or clear than it does in Acts 2, 42, when it said, they, the early church, devoted themselves to four things. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Maybe put another way, Bible, fellowship, communion, and prayers. Now, we've preached on that. I've already, I've already dealt with those, but just circle back in a minute here to, to look at some of these things because I think what we saw is those elements played true throughout the rest of Acts. It wasn't just like saying at the very beginning this is what they were all about, but instead we watched that play out faithfully as the early church developed. So, so teaching and preaching, the Word of God, the Bible, is unmistakably, I think, the central activity in ministry of the church. I, I hope you'd agree with that. The activity of the Holy Spirit that we see uh, very, again, unmistakably throughout the entire early church came alongside the preaching of the Word and bolstered up the preaching of the Word. The Spirit fell when the early church was, was do- they, they dived into the Word, when they were preaching. The, the Lord came along with His Spirit and rubber-stamped it, His approval on the preaching through the actions of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, God, the, the, the Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity, all of them are on board with the Word being the central lifeblood of the church the central piece of ministry. And it is the means by which the church is grown. Listen to some of these statements that we've heard already from the book of Acts. Chapter 4, verses 31 to 33. It says, When they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. They dove into the word. They spoke the word with all boldness. They gave their testimony. That was a major part, the major part of their ministry. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. Every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. The word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. How does the church grow? In other words, how are unbelievers brought to faith in Christ and added to our number? It's through the word of the Lord being preached and being taught and being proclaimed day in and day out by the church. This is central to who the church is and ought to be. The second piece is the church's fellowship. The church's fellowship. Now this is seen not only in time spent together in the same room, perhaps with some light refreshments, but the fellowship of the church is carried out through the caring for one another in and for the gospel. See, fellowship, that word fellowship is more participation in ministry than it is parties and potlucks. And yet we use it the second way more often than we do the first. So it could be said In fact, I think it's accurate to say that we have a greater sense of fellowship when we we go out here and we we work together to spruce up the the outside of the church or we take care of ministry here. Or we we experience fellowship when we put our, our labors into making soup on Wednesday night to feed the body and to feed our neighbors. Uh, We experience fellowship when we take part in downtown ministries and the work that they're doing and and watching lives be changed through the name of Jesus. That's fellowship. It's partnership. It's not just enjoying a good time with a cup of coffee. There is that is a part of the church. We'll see that in a second. But but fellowship is specifically elbow grease, working toward a goal. 
specifically the goal of the gospel spreading. The fellowship of the, of the believers is central. Partnership in this ministry is central to who the church is and who the church should be. Thirdly, communion or the Lord's Supper was important and it was frequent. It was a frequent part of their gatherings to the extent that as we read through the book of Acts and it says they broke bread together, it's pretty difficult to distinguish whether the breaking of bread was just breaking bread and eating or whether it included the Lord's Supper. Right? In other words, when they broke bread, if we take what, 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 um, what the Lord said, what Paul said the Lord said about the Lord's Supper, it seems like whenever the church got together to break bread, they remembered the Lord's death until he came. So when they sat down for a meal together as the church, specifically as the church, and they shared that meal, that was an opportunity for them to remember the Lord's death. And doesn't that fit? Doesn't it fit for the church to be more frequently reminded of who we are and why we are? When we gather together and we say, Lord, we we are one body because your body was broken for us. And we have that in the forefront of our mind and as, the, as one of the main facets of the picture of our identity of who we are in Christ. Communion, table fellowship together, breaking bread with one another, participation in Christ, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. Participation with, with one another, discerning the body of Christ around us, looking around and saying, our brothers and sisters here, we are the body of Christ as we break the body of Christ, as we remember Christ's body broken for us. Communion, the Lord's Supper, is a central piece of the early church's life together. Remembering the Lord's death until he comes. And then finally, prayer. Prayer. I don't think it should be too uh, hard of a task to point to the fact that prayer was an absolute, non-negotiable, ultimate expression of dependence upon the, upon the Father and the means of guidance for the church. I'm going to quote at length. There's this little booklet that's been out, uh, I think it's on the welcome table now, that's been out for some Uh, months really, but it's called The Vital Place of the Prayer Meeting. I'm going to quote at length uh, some of what this this author says, this pastor here, regarding prayer in in the book of Acts. He says, The place and importance of the church prayer meeting can be seen from the opening chapters of the book of Acts. Pentecost was born out of the church prayer meeting. We are not told how often the disciples adjourned for refreshments, but we know that they continued earnestly in prayer until the Holy Spirit came in power. How many today really believe in praying for revival? Soon after Pentecost, when there were serious setbacks, fierce persecutions threatened the cause, and the apostles were forbidden to preach anymore. What could be done? There was only one answer. The church prayer meeting. They got together and told the Lord all about it. He responded by giving the building a gentle shake, a token of his support. Later, persecution raged again. James was beheaded. We just heard about that last week. Peter was arrested and imprisoned. And what did the disciples do? They had only one recourse, the church prayer meeting. As on former occasions, it was daily and continued for eight days right up to the eve of the hour when Peter was to be executed. In answer to their intercession, the Lord sent an angel who took Peter out of his chains and through the locked doors as effortlessly as a great liner sails out to sea. And where did Peter go when he found himself free? Why, well, he went to the church prayer meeting. How did he know where to find the prayer meeting? Do you think the leading apostle would not know where to find the prayer meeting? (laughs) And when he arrived, it took time to get in because they could hardly believe it was Peter alive and well. Why did they find it hard to believe? Because like us, they only half believed in the effectual nature of prayer. He begins this little pamphlet by saying, "It It is said that the weekly prayer meeting is the spiritual barometer for any local church. You can tell with a fair degree of accuracy 
what the church is like by the demeanor or substance of the weekly prayer meeting. Prayer is an absolute central piece of who the church is. Because it is in prayer meeting together when we join our hearts, when we join our voices, sometimes when we join hands together, centered around a single topic, calling out to the Father to answer our prayers. That is when the church's dependence on Him for whatever it is that we do is most clearly seen. Prayer is a vital piece of the church's pattern, the vision for this church. So Bible, fellowship, communion, and prayer, these four things are the inner pieces of the church which must be in place. They must be. So I ask us, do we have a vision for these things in our church? When you think of your life, your connection, your peace, your part in Goshen First Brethren Church, does it funnel through those four things? Does it involve those four pieces as it relates to how you're going to interact and engage with the body life here? But turning now outward, what should our vision for ministry outside of this building be? Or in some cases, inside this building. What, what, should our, what should our vision be for how we then engage with others, with non-believers, right? We just saw how we engage with one another. What about when we turn out, outward uh, to, to engage with those who have not known Christ? It, really, the, the sum of it is the title of this uh, mes, uh, message uh, series, Christ's Kingdom Commission, carrying out the mission of spreading the kingdom of of Jesus. That is what uh, the, the, the pattern in the book of Acts that is laid out for us. And there's three facets uh, in our text that we saw back in Acts chapter 28. Three facets of this commission that I want to leave us with from the end of, uh, uh, of, of the book of Acts in chapter 28. That Christ's kingdom commission, as we go out into the world, it's going to be three things. It's going to be costly. It's going to be unrestricted. And it will be unrestrained. Costly, unrestricted, and unrestrained. First, Christ's kingdom commission is costly. Verse 28 says, Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Verse 29, he, uh, excuse me, verse uh, 30. He lived there two whole years at his own expense. See, Paul had a spirit-given resolution to pass through Macedonia, Achaia, and Jerusalem, and ultimately to end up in Rome. We hear about that in chapter 19, verse 21. The Lord himself, at a later point, came to Paul in the temple barracks as he was locked up and assured Paul that he would indeed give his testimony in Rome. Chapter 23, verse 11. Now, Rome was not certainly the end of the earth, but it was the center of the empire and proved to be the main hub for the kingdom growth, not only in the period of the early church, but we know from history for centuries to come, the gospel thundered forth from Rome. But what did it cost Paul to get to Rome to carry out his commission to take the gospel there? Well, first it cost him his freedom. It cost him his freedom. Chapter 27, right before chapter 28, is all about the prisoner voyage that had much difficulty at sea, had a hard time getting where it was meant to go, ended up in a shipwreck, but ultimately it was that voyage that took Paul to Rome, that got him there to appeal to Jesus, uh, to, to Caesar. Why? Why did that happen? Why did it end that way? Because Jesus said it would. Jesus said he would, uh, he would stand before Caesar. So Paul was a prisoner. And that's how he got to Rome. That's how he got to his ministry location, was in chains. We don't often think about that being our path to ministry, do we? <laughs> right? Where maybe I'm going to have to get arrested and then make my appeal uh, throughout the different 
channels in order to go and testify in front of the people that I've been called to testify to. That was Paul's story. It cost him his freedom. It also cost time. Do you notice it said in verse 29, he, uh, 30, he lived there two whole years. He lived in Rome for two years under house arrest. That is no leisurely trip to Rome. I'm sure that he did not experience all the, the sights and the sounds and the smells and the tastes of that city. There's a lot to see. Right? No, he was on house arrest. He was not allowed to leave his house. In fact, he was chained to an imperial guard the entire time that he was there in that house. But that's often the truth of gospel ministry is that it costs us time. Sometimes gospel ministry means sticking put, staying put in one spot, sticking there long enough to see the fruit of the gospel develop. Right? Sometimes it means making inroads into a place where you may never see the fruit bear out. Sometimes it means planting seeds year and year and year after year that you never actually get to harvest. Sometimes it means being there for decades before you see one convert to Christ. It costs time. And especially in our culture, time is a very costly entity. It's something that is very precious to us. And yet it's something that Christ's kingdom commission will often call us to give up. It also cost Paul his money. His money. Do you see? It said that he stayed there under house arrest at his own expense. He waited for his hearing before Caesar under house arrest in a house that he paid for. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the civil rights outrage if that were to happen today? Hey, by the way, you're in jail and you need to pay rent for your cell while you're here. Right? At his own expense, he stayed there. Why not just withdraw your appeal to Caesar? Why not just go back to Jerusalem, Paul? It's getting way too costly. It's, it's costing you way too much. You could be used elsewhere. Why stay there? Well, because Jesus told him to. Because the Spirit gave him this commission and so he stayed. Lastly, it cost him opportunity. It cost him opportunity. As any economics teacher will explain to you, the cost of doing business in one area is not just in dollars, but it's also the opportunity cost. Right? It's costing you the opportunity of doing business over here, right? Because we have limited time. We have limited resources, limited uh, strength and, and energy. So if you decide to go here, it means that you're not going to go there. It costs opportunities. It costs other activities, right? It costs other ventures and other ministries that could have been pursued on any given day, week, or year, or possibly even a lifetime, if you choose to follow Christ's kingdom commission, it will mean choosing not to follow other pursuits. It will cost opportunities. And here, on this point, is perhaps the greatest cost to us when it comes to Christ's kingdom commission. The opportunity cost is great in our culture because we are a people who have vast opportunities laid in front of us. We are not, for the most part, a people who are sitting around trying to figure out something to do. Right? On any given weekend, on any given Sunday, on any given week during the summer, on any given year, there are opportunities that stack up of things that could uh, vie for our time. And so if a ministry opportunity gets laid in front of us, it is likely that there will be a conflict with something else that needs to be decided about, that needs to be worked through. And so Christ's kingdom commission in our life, us carrying it out, will often mean saying no to certain things, to other things, in order to say yes to the ministry of the gospel. And we're foolish to think that that's not the case. We're foolish to think that, that we can have our cake and eat it too, and that we can have church just sprinkled on top or added in, or it can be, you know, one among many, right? There, there will be, and there, prob there probably, I'm sure, actually 
certainly has been a time where this has already come up in your life where you've had to decide between X and Y, where Y is ministry and X is something else. It's going to cost us. Jesus said to his disciples that it's wise to count the cost before you follow him. Right? And that, that's not a very uh, uh, popular evangelistic method or uh, <laughs> uh, ministry method there to tell people, hey, by the way, um, before, you, before you pray to accept Christ as your Savior, I want to tell you what it's going to cost you. I want to tell you what it's going to mean laying down, walking away from. But Jesus said that's what we ought to do. We ought to call people to say, here's what it's going to cost. Are you willing? Are you ready for that? And if we say yes, then to turn back and say, eh, actually, I'm not really willing to lay that stuff down. Right, then we haven't followed Christ. So are we as a church, are we willing to give up anything? Or are we insistent on having the things that we already have and, and not, not losing a thing? Are we as individuals willing to pay the price tag, whatever it might be, for following Christ wherever he leads? Are we willing to have a costly engagement with the kingdom of God? If we are, if we are willing, if we find in our hearts today, yes, Lord, I recognize that you've called us to a lot and it's going to mean, it's going to mean some, some serious cost. I want to give you a promise that the Lord gives to those who lay down things for the sake of his kingdom. Matthew 19, 29, he says, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or lands for my namesake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Do you see what eternal life is tied to? Leaving fathers and mothers and houses and lands. In other words, giving up opportunities. It's costly. But the reward is far, far greater. Far greater. Christ's kingdom commission is costly and is also unrestricted. It is unrestricted. Verse 30 says that while Paul was in Rome, he received any guest who would come to him. His ministry focus in Rome was not demographically narrow. He didn't say, I'm going to go uh, preach to this particular people. He said, my door is open. I got nothing better to do. <laughs> Literally, nothing better to do. Because there is nothing better than Christ's kingdom commission. He said, so come on in. Right? The, 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 the freedom that Paul had to minister while he was on house arrest was remarkable. So, so who did Paul minister to? Well, frankly, anyone who was within earshot. But that included the haughty Jews. The haughty Jews. I use that term very specifically. Look at verse 17. Right, when he got there, after three days, when he got to Rome, he called the local leaders of the Jews, and then when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Here, here he is telling the Jews why he's in, in Rome. He says, because the Jews delivered me over, even though I did nothing to them. I did nothing against them. Verse 23, he says, when they had appointed a day for him, they, the, this group of Jews, came to him at his lodging in great numbers. And from morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Verse 24, some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved and disagreeing among themselves. They departed after Paul made one statement. So in other words, they, they, they heard Paul out. They heard, his, they heard his spiel about Jesus being the promised Messiah. Some of them believed what he said was true. Other people did not, were not convinced by this. And then what took place is the, the two groups started arguing with one another. Right? So, so there, there's this disagreement happening, but one thing broke up the disagreement. One thing sent both groups out Paul's door and it is when he said, verse 26, he quoted the prophet Isaiah, for this people's heart has grown dull. 
With their ears, they can barely hear. With their eyes, they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, he says to the Jews, let it be known to you, the Jews, that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. The implication is the Jews won't listen. Their ears are stopped up. Their hearts are closed off. They have raised themselves in in haughtiness above the message of the promised gospel. They won't give up on their traditions. Now up until this point, it was Paul's habit to go to the synagogue first to present the gospel there. We we see this in in the book of Romans. Uh, I'm going to give you a flyover real fast of some of these verses that, that lay out what does the church, what's the interaction of the church with Israel? Because that question was asked on a Wednesday night just rec- or a Wednesday morning recently, and I'm sure it's been on many of your minds as well as the events have unfolded in the Middle East. What does the church have to do with Israel? Well, in Romans chapter nine through 11, Paul a- answers that exact question, very specifically. Romans nine verse four. He says, they are Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac, the child of promise, shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as his offspring. What does he say? He says the Israelites are the ones who have everything set out before them. They have the covenants. They have the promise. They have the patriarchs. They, were, they, were made, they had made in the shade. And what, it, what happened? Not all of them were true Israel. In other words, not all of them were the people of God. Why? Because they were not the people of the promise. In other words, they did not see Christ and say, that's what, is, that's what we've been waiting for. They rejected the fulfillment of those promises. Chapter 9, verse 30 says, What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. Brother, Uh, Chapter 10, verse 1, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What's the dividing line? For these people of God, when when it says that they are Israel or they're not Israel, what did they do with Christ? He said the law points to Jesus. If they reject Jesus, they've rejected the law. They've rejected the righteousness that they said was theirs, that they were seeking after. Why? Because they sought after it as if it were by works and not by faith. And that is not the people of God. They rejected the fulfillment of the scriptures. And yet, and yet God in his mercy extends hope for them. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. So I ask, did they stumble, the Jews stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their inclusion mean? He says in verse 23, And even if they who do not continue in their unbelief, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted back in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if 
You were cut from what is by nature an olive, a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. How much more will these, the natural branches that were cut off, be grafted back in to their own olive tree? He says, verse 29, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. They cannot be brought back. They have gone out to them. So, not all Israel is Israel. But it is those who accept Christ by faith that are Israel. And the Jews who have the promise, who have grown up with the promise, who have had the patriarchs, who have the lineage, any of them who turn in faith to Christ will be grafted back into the tree from which they were cut because of their disbelief. There is hope extended out for this people. Romans chapter 10 verses 8 to 13, what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call to him, for everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. The gospel commission, Christ's kingdom commission, is unrestricted when it comes to who it goes to. It doesn't matter. Unrestricted. So how, what, what do we do with Israel? How do we support Israel, the nation state of Israel? Do we do that as, as a church? Well, here's the thing. Whatever you decide politically about that arrangement, the primary support for that nation, for that people group, should be through the preaching of the Messiah, the gospel. Because that is their hope. That is the blessing that has been laid out in front of them. That is the, 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 the consummation of everything that they are as a people. Paul says it's unrestricted to the haughty Jews, the ones that have lifted their heart up against God, and the hungry Gentiles. He says back in chapter uh, 28 of the book of Acts, they will listen. They will listen. They're hungry. They want truth. They want answers. They want to find out what their place is in this world. They want to figure out who they are as individuals, as humans. They've been scratching the surface on, on God's truth. They have it written on their hearts, and yet when they, they don't have the full revelation of the truth yet. So when I bring it to them, when I lay out in front of them who they are as a creation of the Lord and as an image bearer of God, as one who owes worship to their creator, he says they're going to listen to that. They won't turn away. They are hungry. And here's the thing. This has always been the plan of God. The inclusion of the Gentiles has always been the plan. I don't have time to read these, these passages for you, but in, a, in the book of Isaiah, Paul quotes from Isaiah here in, in our passage. But Isaiah, all throughout the Scriptures, chapter 2, chapter 11, chapter 42, 49, and 66, Paul reaches out and says that one day what's happening is the, Jew, or the Gentiles will be brought in. That God's people will be, will be brought from all four corners of the earth. Sometimes Christians will like to say, well, this whole Gentile thing, it wasn't really planned this way. It was just that, that God made a detour because the Jews rejected Jesus. So now there's this period of history where it really wasn't foreseen by any of the prophets that the Gentiles would be brought in, but it's just kind of God making the best of it. That's... Complete garbage, in my humble opinion. Isaiah lays out again and again, no, the Gentile, it is, it is God's people. We are in his image. It is God's plan to redeem all of humanity, to bring people from every tribe and language and nation and tongue. And that's not just plan B, that's plan A. So we pray for the peace of Israel, as we should for any country. Because 
What we want is the blessing of God. That's why, we, well, that's why we're motivated to pray for them, isn't it? We want the blessing of God to rest on our nation, and so we pray for that nation. But friends, we have the fullness of the blessing of God. Do, do you know that? In Christ, we have the fullness of the blessings that were promised to Israel. Everything that was promised to the people of Israel is yes and amen in Jesus. All of the promises that were given to God's people Israel are found, have their fulfillment in Christ, Galatians 3.16. We are the inheritors of all of those promises. We have all those blessings. So perhaps... The move more in line with what we read in Romans and throughout the Old Testament would be for us Gentiles to live in God's blessings in such a way as to make the Jews jealous that they might turn to the blessing that they missed. Isn't that what Paul said? The, that the gospel went to the Gentiles, it went out to the nations in order that they might be jealous. But here's the question. Is the church any good at living out the, the gospel blessings? Do we live in such a way that the, that the Jews are looking in at the church and saying, man, I wish we had that. Somehow they got it better than we did. What's up with that? What if the church lived so fully in the blessings of the gospel that the, 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 the Jews would look in and say, we, we missed the boat somewhere here because they have the same scriptures as we do in the first half and yet we don't have the blessings that they do on the back half. That's the move. That's what God is doing. Are we living in such a way as to make them feel that jealousy? Christ's kingdom commission, lastly, is unrestrained. Paul's prison situation put no limits on the gospel commission. During this imprisonment is when Paul wrote letters uh, like Philippians and like Colossians. This is when he wrote Philemon. And in Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, Paul describes uh, his situation that we just read about there in, um, in Romans 28, when, or Acts 28. He, he says here, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, in other words, the chains, has served to advance the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard uh, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Paul says, guess what has happened? I'm chained to these, uh, these imperial Caesar guards, and guess what's happened? They've, they've heard the gospel again and again and again. As they rotate through, each guy takes his shift. There's another guy that's heard the gospel now. There's more guards. When other opportunity would he have to go and preach to these guys that are literally the secret service for the emperor? Paul says, I want you to know what happened. I got chained up, and now the imperial, the imperial guard knows Jesus. One evangelist said, if I land behind bars, it will be God's cue for me to start a prison ministry. <laughs> have you ever thought about that? That it may be chains that bring you to the fullness of your ministry. Second Timothy chapter 2, Paul wrote this on his second Roman imprisonment right before his execution. He writes to Timothy, he says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. It is unrestrained. Verse 31, he says that the word of God is to be exclaimed and explained. Paul proclaimed the kingdom of God. Hear, hear me. Paul proclaimed the kingdom of God in Rome <laughs> to the imperial guards. He said, Jesus is Lord, where Caesar is Lord. The announcement of God's kingdom will by necessity come into contact with any other rule that doesn't bow the knee to King Jesus and that does not one bit restrain the gospel. The gospel will win out every time. The word of God cannot be bound by that. The word about Jesus is also taught and explained, he says. 
Jesus said to teach them, right, in his commission, to teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. So we must remember, friends, that kingdom life, the, the kingdom commission is different than normal life. If we're going to live as kingdom followers, it's going to look different than what we were living before. We shed off our old life. We must be set aside or taught to set aside our old ways and to take up the new ways of life in Christ. So the word of God is exclaimed and it is explained uh, and, and it is done boldly and unbounded. This is the last few verses. I mean, just wrap up the book of Acts in your mind with this bow on top, that the word of God was preached with boldness and without restraint, unhindered. John Stott said boldness is when, thing is, uh, when a thing is, is spoken candidly with no concealment of the truth, clearly, with no obscurity of expression, and confidently, with no fear of consequences. It is bold speech that the church prayed for after being persecuted. It is bold speech that characterized the message of the gospel of grace in the early church because bold speech is fitting for a kingdom of a victorious Christ. Without hindrance, no boundaries, for the gospel, no quarter where it may not be proclaimed, no action that can stand against it. Prison can't stop it. Princes can't stop it. Politics can't stop it. Policies can't stop it. Persecution can't stop it. When the church is convinced of her mission and committed to carrying out that commission, Christ's kingdom commission will be built. And like Isaiah said, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. That is our marching orders. To carry the kingdom of God to the ends of the world so that there is no end to his government where he rules. This is and ought to be the outward facing vision of any church that claims Christ. To close, I want to tell you about a story and ask you to pray for a brother in Phoenix, Arizona. His name is Pastor Hans Schmidt. He is a, a young pastor. He's a veteran, an army veteran. He was, he's married, has two young children, one recently born. And Hans, on Wednesday morning, was preaching the gospel at a very busy intersection when a passerby came and pulled a gun and shot him in the head. And he's currently, the last I saw, he's currently in critical condition in the hospital and his family has asked us to pray. He was out preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus to the city of Phoenix. And somebody came and, and wanted to end that, wanted to restrain that, wanted to restrict that. But let me tell you what's happened. God's ministry of the gospel is unbounded. So now as a result of this, incident, there are thousands, if not more, people praying for his recovery. There are news stations in Arizona and around the country who have to report that this gospel preacher was shot while he was doing ministry. And there are questions that are being asked all over in these news articles. Why would somebody come and do this? Why would somebody be so against the message of the gospel in Phoenix. See, friends, God's word is not bound. God's word cannot be restricted. Even when our lives are the cost, it cannot ultimately win out over Christ's kingdom commission. So let me ask you something. What better vision would you want to have as a church? What what, what better marching orders, what better uh, picture of who we are and what we're called to do can you come up with other than taking part in this ministry that is guaranteed success, that is guaranteed global success, that is guaranteed blessings no matter where you go or, or who you speak to. This, this, I think, is the vision for our church. So as we look in the mirror of the, the book of Acts and we see Goshen First Brethren staring back at it, think about what, what things match, what things don't. 
And think about the glories that we have when we say, okay, Lord, I want that. I want that, no matter the cost. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you've called us to something that is unstoppable, something that is unrestricted, that is immeasurable in its goodness to us and to the world. Motivate us, Lord. Focus our gaze on this. Help us to never waver away from these things. And if you do it, Lord, it will be for the glory of your Son and it will be for the good of our people here and for the good of our city, for our families, and for our nation. So we pray it in his name. Amen. Well, let's open it.